okay so now next we are going to see that our two relations that we have seen in this section one of them of course is the ordinary minor relation and the other one is the topological minor relation both of them are partial orderings on the class of all finite graphs so that means each one of them is reflexive antisymmetric and transitive so we are now going to prove this so let's see the proof actually parts of the proof we have already seen in the course of going through the things so far so we first look at the minor relation let g1 g2 and g3 be graphs although in the statement it has been explicitly mentioned on the class of all finite graphs but because we are dealing with finite graphs and we won't see infinite graphs until we reach chapter 8 i think so we are not again mentioning that uh, the graphs we have considered here are finite because it's understood so let this uh, be graphs so what are the things we need to show here reflexivity means what we need to show that g1 is a minor of g1 i am manu to write this nicely anyway you understand g1 is a minor of itself and this is something we have already uh, mentioned we have made this statement before you remember uh, after defining minors we proved that proposition 171 where we showed that a minor can be obtained from a given graph by uh, deleting some vertices and edges and contracting some edges there after uh, having that proposition we made one uh, statement where we said that in particular every subgraph of a graph is its minor and still in particular every graph is a minor of itself so we are going to just simply mention that thing here and uh, say that the relation is reflexive if you want you can go back to that discussion and see exactly why this is the case uh, we are not going to repeat that here again so we write like this as we observe earlier g1 is a minor of g1 yeah, here the symbol is somewhat okay hence the minor relation is reflexive next comes anti-symmetry anti-symmetry says that if g1 is a minor of g2 and g2 is a minor of g1 then it implies that g1 is equal to g2 but because we are uh, dealing with uh, mathematical structures so it's enough to show that g1 is isomorphic to g2 because normally we do not distinguish between isomorphic uh, structures so if g1 is isomorphic to g2 that is the same as having g1 equal to g2 okay so uh, that this is the thing we are now going to show so let us start by assuming this hypothesis and then uh, have the conclusion somehow let g1 be a minor of g2 and 
g2 b l minor of g1 okay now we have to do something because this is not unlike uh, unlike reflexivity this is not uh, already there for us we don't have anything so we have to argue so let's now go back to the actual definition of a binary then there exist subgraphs okay let us first see what this thing means let's recall what does it mean for g1 to be a minor of g2 it means this you have g2 in g2 you have found some subgraph say h2 and on h2 if you perform some h contractions then you get a graph that is isomorphic to g1 when this happens we say that g1 is a minor of g2 ordinary minor so from these two relations we are going to get two such subgraphs for which some things will happen so let's now write them down so there exist subgraphs h1 okay i should first of all write about h2 because uh, of this but anyway let's just write the ones first h1 because anyway we have to write both the things subgraphs h1 of g1 and h2 of g2 such that h1 is m g2 and h2 is m g1 this uh, notation is slightly confusing we may get confused very easily if we think of m as an operation you see g1 is a minor of g2 means h2 is a subgraph of g2 on which if we are performing h contractions then we are getting g1 so we are doing something to h2 namely a series of h contractions to get g1 we are not this notation does not suggest that we are doing something to g1 and getting h2 no we are i mean at least from the point of view of applying h contractions which is the natural way to think about it we are doing something to h2 and then we are getting g1 but of course this is a way of writing things so that's just it uh, such that this okay now uh, let us just look at what we have here the situation is like this a little figure will help us So the situation is like this we have say let's first of all draw g1 in g1 we have the subgraph h1 from which through some h contractions we have got a graph isomorphic to g2 but we can just simply say g2 but at the same time we also have this this is our g2 in which there is a subgraph h2 
on H2 also we have applied a some series of H contractions and that has led us to G1. So you can see that things are getting reduced in size. First you, you are having H1 from G1 where there likely is a reduction. Likely I say because H1 may be equal to G1 also. That may also happen. And then we are performing H contractions on H1 to get G2. That will uh, among other things uh, reduce the order of the graph. We will have likely less vertices and here also I am saying likely because you actually may not have to perform any H contraction. You can just keep H1 as H1 and that is just it. In fact, that is how we have the statement that every subgraph of a graph is a contraction. Okay, where actually you do not uh, perform any H contraction but it is a trivial case. You, you understand. So the point here is that as we move from G1 to G2 through H1, likely there is a reduction in both order as well as size. Order is the number of vertices and size is the number of edges. Okay. So let us now argue like this. So we can of course continue from here itself. But let the figure be like this. Now, the order of G1 is of course greater than or equal to the order of H1 which is greater than or equal to the order of G2, comma, the order of G2 like that is greater than or equal to the order of H2 which is greater than or equal to the order of G1. And of course the same thing can be said about uh, the sizes that is the numbers of edges. Also which uh, if you go back to the first section you will see that this double vertical lines denote uh, the size of G1 that is the cardinality of the edge set of G1 or put more simply the number of edges in G1. So this is also greater than or equal to the number of edges in H1 which is greater than or equal to the number of edges in G2 and the size of G2 is greater than or equal to the size of H2 which is greater than or equal to the size of G1. So from these inequalities of course we can directly see that G1 and G2 have the same order as well as the same size and because of this actually H1 is equal to G1 and H2 is equal to G2. So let us first write that conclusion from these inequalities we see that
the order of G1 must be equal to the order of G2. So the intermediate things also will be equal. and the similar equations involving sizes. Now, you see, we are writing all these things together because from the inequalities actually the conclusion that we are getting is that the orders of g1 and g2 are equal and the fact that these are also equal to them uh, then also comes as a consequence. Now we concentrate on this equation and this equation that h2 and g2 have the same order and similarly this one and this one. You see, H1 is a subgraph of G1, which has the same order as G1, which is this first equation, and has the same size also as G1. That means, in obtaining H1 from G1, we actually have not lost any vertex or any edge. And that just simply means that H1 is equal to G1 absolutely equal to G1. It's the same thing as G1. Similarly, H2 is equal to G2. Thus, G1 is equal to H1 and G2 is equal to H2. Okay, now next we uh, again go back to the fact that actually we have obtained g2 from h1 through a series of h contractions and also g1 from h2 through a series of h contractions but uh, for that we of course have to uh, refer to that proposition where we showed that this minor thing is actually obtained through a series of h contractions now by proposition one seven one, I think. Yes, G one is. obtained oh why okay i could have written it at once not only just about g1 but g2 also uh, like this g1 respectively g2 is obtained from H2 respectively H1 I think uh, what have I written here yeah okay I think I need commas here fine so uh, from H2 through through or by anything you can write through a series of H contractions now if G1 is or uh, okay let me put it this way 
if in obtaining jivan from h2 we actually had to go through at least one contraction then the order will decrease yeah now we don't need this figure we have already seen if in obtaining g1 from h2 we actually had to perform uh, there is no need to write had we actually have to perform some h contractions then okay then what this general inequality is there even now after proving that these things are equal still this inequality is true because we have the provision of having equality but now because uh, if there is some age contraction through which we have to go then the order has uh, has been reduced so this will be strictly greater than this which is a contradiction okay it's a contradiction and it is in fact a contradiction to this that g1 and g2 must have the same order so okay so now what is the implication of this that means in obtaining g1 from h2 in fact we did not uh, have to go through or rather i should uh, say we did not go through any h contraction so that just simply means that G, you can say g1 equal to h2 but it will be more appropriate to say g1 is isomorphic to h2 so uh, let us just directly write that g1 is isomorphic to h2 and h2 is what h2 is just simply g2 where have we written it here see this one so we have proved that g1 and g2 are actually the same graph up to isomorphism and that's what we wanted to show and this proves that our minor relation is antisymmetry thus oh i was thinking we have had to do in fact more for this but here itself it ends fine thus our minor relation is anti symmetric okay next we come to transitivity next let g1 be a minor of g2 and g2 be a minor of g3 and that is why in fact uh, to have this kind of thing we started off with three graphs in the first place so now again to make the situation readily understandable we are going to draw another figure
the problem with this type of statements is that the statements sound very true plausible and in fact they are and the other thing is that it seems like their proofs should be very easy and straightforward that is also true the proofs are straightforward but because of this uh, assumed simplicity sometimes we may not uh, look so deeply and discover that there are some fine points which we may easily miss and this is uh, one such thing is going to uh, come now so you see what is happening here is this again like before we have g2 so there is some subgraph h2 on which we have possibly performed some edge contractions and we have got g1 and again we have a graph g3 where say now we have a subgraph h3 on which some possible edge contractions led us to g2 that's what having these relations mean means okay so now what uh, now how can we combine these two things to say that g1 is a minor of g3 it seems like it will be almost obvious it is but there is a, a peculiar problem here you see after proving proposition 171 which states that you can obtain a minor from a given graph by first of all considering a subgraph and then some edge contractions on that subgraph. If you do that, you will get a minor. Now, if you take these words very seriously, you should take these words very seriously in particular what i am saying here is that if you take the order of the events very seriously how the things are going is that first you consider a subgraph and because we are thinking of the entire uh, thing as a uh, succession of operations we are doing something to the original graph we are doing a sequence or a series of some things to the original graph and we are obtaining g1 so instead of just simply saying that consider a subgraph g2 uh, a subgraph of g2 we just imagine that h2 itself has been obtained from g2 through a sequence of deletions vertex and edge deletions whatever is necessary and then after that we perform some age contractions on h2 and then we obtain g1 if we take things like this then there is a problem you see if you start with g3 because in this situation that is the largest one right which is the one on which uh, things start so what do we do first we have g3 we possibly delete some vertices and edges from G3, we then get H3. On H3, what we then do, we perform some edge contractions. We get G2 or a subgraph isomorphic, I mean a graph isomorphic to G2. Now we are here. Then we repeat that process by first having a subgraph of G2 and then again you perform some edge contractions and finally you get g1 but if you look at this entire process it's not like this that you have started with g3 you then found some subgraphs the h of g3 and then through a series of edge contractions you are getting g1 exactly that is not happening along the journey you had to stop at g2 and then you had to possibly that possibility is there delete some vertices and or some edges from g2 to 
to first obtain H2 and then you resume H contraction. So you uh, first have this subgraph which may be H3 itself. I mean uh, whatever you want you first have the subgraph fine. Then you start contracting edges of H but then in the middle somewhere where you will get G2 you stop edge contraction and start vertex edge deletion and then you have to resume edge contraction. This does not seem like having a minor. It seems like something more complicated. But luckily if you observe something then you can salvage matters. The thing here is that okay fine the way we have proceeded to prove proposition 171 or in fact the way we have defined this relation minor. First a subgraph comes and then through a series of edge contractions we, we are getting the minor, the graph that is the minor of the original graph. However, we can also obtain G1 from G2 through a series of these operations but actually done in any order. Okay, that can be done. It is not necessary to first of all con consider the subgraph by deleting these unnecessary things and then only performing the edge contractions. You can in fact just simply consider the subgraph H2 in G2, concentrate your attention only on H2 and then do whatever you want to do, whatever age contractions you want to do inside H2. Let the other things which are outside H2, uh, let them be. And then what you do, you can delete these unnecessary things. Now note that whatever is happening inside H2 that actually will not significantly change the exterior of H2 in G2. I mean uh, in G2 means I am saying this uh, outer uh, scale, uh, I mean uh, this uh, graph that is uh, changing, okay that that's what I am calling G2. So G2 is there, so instead of deleting these vertices and edges to get H2 first, you start doing whatever you want to do inside H2 but then simultaneously also whenever you please you are also performing those deletions at one step of course you are doing one operation either an edge contraction or some vertex deletion or some edge deletion from outside of H2 in G2 you see that you will see that you ultimately get G1 itself so Actually, uh, strictly speaking, we should before uh, proving that uh, this relation is transitive or in fact a part of this proof involves showing this itself that if you have a graph G2 then instead of uh, following the traditional path of first getting a subgraph and then through H contraction you get G1 you can actually do, do these operations in any order you want. You will still get G1 and this result which seems very plausible and in fact is true will allow us to write the proof of this transitivity. But this result I am not going to prove rigorously. I leave this to you. Okay. You may have to write some things and justify things uh, somewhat nicely and in a, I mean, what can I say? In such a manner that things fall in place and you have a proof. It, it won't, I don't think it will be very difficult. I myself have not gone through any formal uh, treatment of this, this observation that I, I have said just now. So I leave this part to you. So we are, what we are going to do, we are just simply going to assume that this is true and finish the proof. Okay, so let us, let's keep these things as they are and we continue our proof. So assuming that what I have said just now is true, we are next going to write this. Then,
G1 respectively G2 is obtained from G2 respectively G3 and this actually this thing has been mentioned by the author himself if you uh, go I in the previous video I think we ourselves mentioned it either in the previous video or the one before it okay so it's there in the text respectively G3 through now not just a series of edge contractions but a series of edge contractions vertex deletion edge deletion okay whatever is necessary we we do that on the graph and we get the other graph Actually, I should write and or, but it's understood. And age contractions so if G2 is obtained uh, in that manner from G3 and G1 is obtained in that manner from G2 then of course you are obtaining G1 from G3 in that manner actually you just uh, look at that some such uh, sequences of transformations you combine them that becomes you just take their composition you that becomes a sequence of again another such sequence of transformations which will take you from G3 to G1 so you just simply write it and that's all G1 is obtained from oh I already have written from G3 through a series of vertex and or age deletions and age contractions so g1 is also a minor of g3 hence this is transitive so being reflexive anti-symmetric and transitive minor the minor relation is a partial ordering on the set of all fine on the class of all finite graphs and one can similarly handle the topological minor it's not uh, that it is more difficult or less difficult than the minor relation it, it is just absolutely similar so I am leaving that to you as well similarly one can show the 
that the topological minor relation is also there partial ordering on the class of all finite graphs and we end the proof here now there are some uh, concluding remarks uh, the section is almost over but let me first refill the final remarks are about embedding embedding a given graph in another graph in several different senses so let's see what Distel has to say about embeddings. So what the author next says is this. Now, now that we have, uh, we of course don't have to write everything down. Now that we have made, met all the standard relations between graphs, we can also define what it means to embed one graph into another. So we just see instead of, okay, what is the need for writing everything? Because if you are following this, then you likely have the text. No. So let me just simply say, basically an embedding, you say you have two graphs g and h what does it mean uh, for g to be embedded in h you can of course uh, understand from the language that it is just simply some type of operation or something a function which allows us to identify g inside h in some particular sense so and that will uh, depend on the context. If we are just simply embedding G inside H as a subgraph, then that means having a function from the vertex set of G into the vertex set of H that is injective a one-to-one -one function so that uh, it's like this now you have uh, you have the graph whatever you have that is G and you have the graph H here injectivity makes sure that there is no unnecessary collapse that you have we are not reducing the size of G or the or uh, anything uh, of G in any manner. So we are just simply taking G and uh, mapping the entirety of G inside H in some particular sense. Of course, if I just simply say mapping, it's just simply a mapping. But uh, there are conditions. Now, based on these conditions, there are different types of embeddings. So what I said is that if we want to embed G inside H as simply a subgraph, 
and if that is possible then there exists an injective mapping from the vertex set of G into the vertex set of H that preserves adjacency in this sense. That if two vertices in G are adjacent in G, then their images are adjacent in H. In symbols, we can write that condition like this. So, what we are saying here is this if you have x and y two vertices in G such that they are adjacent in G, which means they form an edge in G, then this implies that their images under phi which of course are vertices in H because of the nature of this mapping is an edge in H. If this is the condition, if this condition is satisfied then we have identified G inside H as a subgraph or more strictly speaking we have identified a copy of G inside H which is actually isomorphic to G if you think about it because of this uh, preservance of adjacency G will be isomorphic to the image of G under phi inside H. So in that sense we are embedding G inside H as a subgraph. But there are other uh, things also that uh, I mean stringer conditions can be put on this function that will give us stronger embeddings not just as a subgraph as an but as an induced subgraph that is if this function phi preserves not just adjacency but non-adjacency also then you will uh, embed G inside H not just as a subgraph but as an induced subgraph if both adjacency and non-adjacency are preserved. I am not going to discuss anything more about this. I leave that to you okay, to understand why that is so. If both adjacency as well as non-adjacency are preserved, which just okay, what does that mean? Preservance of adjacency just means this. Preservance of non-adjacency means if x and y in v of g are not adjacent then their images are also not adjacent in H. Note that that condition that second one is not automatically a consequence of this. Here we are saying just something about adjacency. So if that additionally is also true then you will end up embedding G inside H as an induced subgraph. And of course there are other uh, things also. For example, if uh, your uh, mapping phi is defined on E of G, that is on the H set of G as well as on V of G and maps the edges of G, whatever edges you have in G, your uh, function maps the edges of G uh, to disjoint paths that is uh, the kind of paths that you have seen in the definition of a topological minor which will have common vertices only at their ends the internal vertices are all disjointive in that manner you can set up a function then you have you can embed G inside H as a topological minor Okay, so that, that kind of thing is also there as a topological manner. Similarly, an embedding phi of G in H as a minor, in the, on the other hand, would be a map that will map vertices of G 
not onto vertices of G but rather onto disjoint sets of vertices in H. Okay, that is we are not going to have a simple function like this. If your function is uh, something like this that for each vertex in G you are having not just a simple vertex in H but sets of vertices in H that are disjoint and connected and all those other conditions are true which you feel recall are things we saw in the definition of this. So that the other conditions are also true that is if uh, two vertices in G are adjacent then there is a connecting edge between the these sets which correspond to these vertices then if all those things are made all those conditions are made then you end up embedding g inside h as an ordinary minor and uh, things can be made more complicated of course by uh, having embeddings as spanning subgraphs or as an induced minor and so on so you, you can understand that you can put more and more restrictions and different kinds of restrictions on phi whatever is necessary in order to embed g inside the larger graph h in that sense not just simply as a subgraph that is the simplest one but in other senses also okay so with that this section ends and in the next section we will study Eulerian tor. Okay, so we will see that in the next graph theory update. And I am ending things here itself for this video. If you want to comment on these things, anything positive or negative, you can write in the comment section below or you can mail me at my usual address. The link will be there in the description. I don't think anyone really sees the description because whenever people ask me, uh, none of them actually have my email address. So it's always there in the description for uh, every video. So that's just it. And tomorrow, uh, what did we do uh, last Saturday? Did we um, solve some? exercises from Lee's algebra I can't exactly remember but we did whether it was Lee or whether it was Galleon I'm not sure whatever the case is we are going to do the next thing if it is Galleon then we will do Lee if it is Lee we will do Galleon so that's just it so I wrap things up with that so see you tomorrow with whatever it turns out to be until then, this is me, Lucifer from a mathematical room. Have a nice day.